dad strength. You know when you're a kid and you're wrestling with your dad and he's just taking off the punches and then all of a sudden, boom, he just takes you down. That's dad strength. Kind of felt like that the day Jesus was setting me straight. Okay, okay, I know hindsight's 2020, but on that day, at that time, at that moment, I, I just couldn't understand what he was talking about. I mean, why would he have to suffer? Why would he have to die? No, no, no. It's not going to happen. Not on my watch. No, sir. So I took him aside. Started to, to lay in on him just a little bit. And he stops me before I get very far, and he looks me in the eyes. You know, he's got those eyes. And you know what he says to me? Get behind me, Satan. Those words, those eyes, they floored me. He floored me. But I mean, seriously, get behind me, Satan. I, I mean, I admit I've got my flaws, but... Satan, that really stung. But I just couldn't see the big picture. Couldn't see it. You see, I, I wanted Jesus to use that bad strength on the world. You know, that was my desire, my plans. But your boy Peter's plans, they don't work out so good all the time i.e. ear slicing, etc. But he knew. He, he saw the whole picture. He, he knew. He was good about giving us just enough rope, about letting us try to figure it out on our own, and yet holding that dad strength for just the right moment when, when we needed saving from ourselves. That was his plan all along, saving us from ourselves, saving me from myself. I was there that day when Jesus walked in. He just stood there at first, almost as in disbelief of what he saw. Then I saw it. I saw the fire growing in his eyes. I come from Galilee to a place where God said to meet us. Did it feel like a scam? Yeah, it did. You see, I'd never been able to afford a lamb for my sacrifice. So I always had to settle for one of those overpriced pigeons. As a young mother and wife, there's a name you don't ever expect to be called. Widow. I never realized how safe I had felt with my husband around until he was gone. Then it felt like being exposed on every which side with nothing between my babies and a world of vipers but me. Just me. So I stood there and watched as Jesus grabbed a whip and drove businessmen out of the temple, poured their money on the ground. But more than that, Something on the expression of his face. I recognized it. He swung that whip like a viper was threatening his kids. He told them, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. It took me three years to figure out what he meant. Slow learning. He wasn't talking about the building. No. That was a place where dishonest men had put their grimy fingerprints on God's glory to follow the intimate process of worshiping Him. That day wasn't about destruction, though. No. It was about hope. Because now, knowing God is all about Jesus. When I think back about that day at the temple and think about what Jesus did and how He did it, it felt like, like being rescued. Sure, at times life can still be brutal. His appetites are still growing. I still cry a lot. But now, you made me a place to be still, where trust and rest meet, right there at God's feet. And the price of that access, it's paid because of Jesus. He conquered death.
613. I had 613 rules to keep. Just, just think about that. Do you even realize how many that is? And I knew them all. And I kept them. Post. So there I am, sitting across from Jesus. And he says, Nicodemus, it's not about rules. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing him, but basically that's what he said. Not about the rules. You have to see this from my perspective. Just the day before, I had seen this guy turn the temple completely upside down. A place, mind you, that I had spent my entire life trying to preserve. So you can understand why I might want to have a talk with him. I mean, how would you feel if someone told you, that if someone that you trusted said to you that what you had devoted your whole life to had missed the point entirely? You're a fool. That's exactly how it makes you feel. So I said to him, I said, only one law seems too good to be true. Because it did. All I had to do was believe that he was the Messiah. The one that had been promised. <clears throat> he glossed over it like it was such a simple thing. Then he went on to talk about light and dark. And evil deeds. Which, which made me think about the Garden of Eden. And original sin. But then I thought, wait. Wait, wait, go back. Go back to where you took... This, this complicated thing. It made it so not complicated. You see, my entire life was in those complications. No, no. My religion was in those complications. In every detail of the law. In making sure that every T was crossed and that every... Well, I thought that that's what would save me. 613 laws. I was wrong. It was love that would save me. For God so loved. When I was a little girl, I remember my mama would always say that she could tell it was about to rain because her elbow would get creaky. Of course, me and my smart mouth, I would say, oh, mama, forget about that elbow. I just listened for the thunder. Now, my mama's elbow didn't always get it right, but uh, that thunder never lies. That night of Passover, I love the Passover. I love remembering how God delivered us. Anyway, that night, everybody just wanted to see him. Everyone had heard about Jesus. I even remember some Greeks pleading with Philip just to see him. And that was all of us in some sense, just wanting to be in the same room with him. You know, it's that feeling you have when you know something is about to happen. You can't explain it. You just know it. And you want to be there when it did. So Jesus starts talking about what was to come. And he said, my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, deliver me from this hour? No. It was for this hour that I came to be here. Father, glorify your name. And then old thunder would come booming down right on time. 
Now this wasn't some rolling noise in the distance. Oh no, sir. This was God's glory. This was a thunder clap sent straight down from heaven. And it wasn't just thunder. It was the voice of God saying, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Yeah. I remember someone asking if it was about to rain. I said, child, that wasn't thunder. That was God. That was a triumphant noise. That was God's glory setting the air on fire with anticipation of things to come. And you didn't need a creepy old elbow to know that. Um, first off, let me get this out there. I didn't steal that donkey. I bought it. And it wasn't even my idea. She just told me to take it. I didn't borrow it. See, earlier today we were walking from Bethany to Jerusalem. There was a whole crowd of us. She just looked at two of us and said, just inside the village, there's an unrented donkey. Go fetch it. And if anyone asks, tell them the Lord needs it and we'll send it back. So the whole way there we were thinking, what does Jesus need with a donkey? But just like so many times before, we learned to stop second guessing Jesus. We didn't ask him and he didn't tell us. When we got back to the donkey, that's when it happened. The crowd started throwing their coats down in front of it, and huh, Jesus got on the donkey. There was cheering and shouting. Some of us grabbed palm branches and started waving them in the air, and that's when it clicked. Jesus has arrived. Let me explain that. Anytime before when Jesus would perform a miracle or teach a parable, we'd get all excited and be like, let's do this or let's do that. He'd be like, not now, not yet. He was so meek, so humble. But today, today was that day we were allowed to jump and shout and dance and wave palm branches and treat him like the Messiah we've been waiting for. I don't know what's going to happen today or in tomorrow or in the weeks to come, but whatever it is, it's going to be okay now because Jesus showed up. And there's nothing better than when Jesus shows up. say the rooster's crow is God's wake-up call. Well, it was for me anyway. The whole day was a blur. I mean, none of us could comprehend. I couldn't comprehend what was going on. I mean, one minute we're in the upper room and Jesus is washing our feet and the next we're in the garden and Jesus goes off to pray by himself. I fell asleep. I admit it. I'm not proud of it. Had a big meal, bread makes me sleep. <laughs> the next thing we know, me, James, and John, Jesus is there in our face and he's trying to wake us up and he says, um, He says, The flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. And then Judas is there, he's, he's kissing Jesus on the cheek, and I, I go to help him and I, I cut this guard's ear off. And, Mind you, I was not aiming for his ear. I, I'm a fisherman, not a swordsman. <coughs> and then they arrest him. And they take him away. And we, we all ran. You see, it wasn't but a couple of hours earlier. We were in the upper room with Jesus. I was sitting there face to face with him. And I said, even if everybody else has owned you, Jesus, I never will. I love you. I'm with you. I'm with you to the end. I think that's what made me stop running and turn around and go back. I got a glimpse of the guards taking Jesus into the high priest's house. I stood there at the gate, and this girl comes up to me, pointing, saying, you're, you're with him. You're with this Jew that claims to be the son of God. I felt like every eye was on me. I didn't know what to do. It. I just brushed her off. I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. I, I don't know him. I made my way into the courtyard and was standing there by the fire. It was cold. I'm trying to warm myself. And 
this guard recognizes me from that whole ear incident, and he's like, get him, arrest him, stop him, he's with him. I'm like, no, you've got the wrong guy, it's not me, I, I wasn't with him, I don't even know him. It was easier the second time to deny him. It was some point before morning, and I'm standing there, and this wise guy comes up to me, and he says, who are you fooling? You have to be with him. I can tell by your accent. This is the way I talk. I, I can't help that that's who I am. And the whole time they're pushing Jesus around. They're, they're pushing him, and they're beating him, and they're spitting on him, and they're throwing insults at him, and I can't take it anymore. I, can't, I just can't take it. And I say some things that I'm not proud of, but I'm like, just leave him alone, okay? Leave him alone. You don't know what you're doing. I don't know him. How else can I say it? I don't know the man. That's when I heard the most blood-curling sound of my life. I heard that rooster crow. And right then, Jesus turned around. He looked right at me. Those eyes, that gaze. When Jesus' eyes are on, you can't escape that gaze. You can't escape it. He knew. And they took him away. Even if I have to die with you, Jesus, I'll never disown you, Jesus. What a joke. I mean, what would you do? At, at that moment, I ran so fast and so long to... And you know what they did? They killed him. Him. He's dead. words and yet drench them in compassion. Who could be strong enough to steal the storms, yet be so meek and humble? Who could allow the hands that created the universe to be nailed to a wooden cross? Who would choose patience despite deserving complete and immediate obedience? be blameless and without fault, but still endure the judgment others deserve. Nobody but Jesus. Nobody but Jesus. Nobody. Who will love us like him? Who will be with us when all others have left? Who comforts us in suffering? Who is our peace in the midst of anxiety? Who reassures me when my mind is drowning in doubt? Who accepts me for who I am with no strings attached? Who would die for me? Although I was still sinking in sin, who turned the grave into Easter morning? Nobody. 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 But, but Jesus. Jesus. Woo! 